Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. I'm really delighted today. We've got a double helping of guests. We've got Jeff King and Donna from Enterprise Holdings. Now, um, Enterprise Holdings covers Enterprise Rent-A-Car, um, Budget, a number of other um, enterprises as well. Can I get Enterprise in one more time? At Enterprise, that will be your Twitter handle. Um, and basically, you've come on because uh, I twisted your arm a little bit because we were talking at the Business Disability Forum about something you're involved in, which is the click away pound. So welcome, Jeff, and welcome, Donna. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what, what got you involved in, in, the, in, um, in the BDF and then involved in, in your journey into getting involved in the click away pound stuff? Sure, I'll get us started. Uh, my name is Jeff King. I've been uh, with Enterprise for 23 years, most of that on the IT side. Uh, cur currently, I, I head up IT for our European operations. And uh, when I came over to the UK three years ago, Donna actually got me involved in our disability, or our, I'm sorry, our um, uh, diversity streams. And uh, disability was one that uh, I chose to be a champion of. So. Um, within our company, we have different, uh, the corporate officers all have different uh, streams of diversity that they become champions for. And so Donna and I both, um, you know, oversee disability along with a couple other people. And so she introduced me to the Business Disability Forum. And uh, I was quite intrigued mainly because it was so business focused. Um, and so it, it just was a good way, I thought, to, to promote businesses to do the right thing. So. Uh, from there, I got hooked up with the Technology Task Force, where, I, Neil, I met you, and uh, have been able to, to learn a lot from the task force and technology, and, and then that led us to the click order, which I, well, I'm sure we'll get into uh, a little bit more detail as we move forward. Yeah, thank you. And Donna? Great. I'm Donna Miller, and I've been with Enterprise for 25 years. Uh, started as a management trainee and then moved into HR and have worked uh, around the world, worked with our operations in North America, both on the United States side as well as Canada, and then have been working with Europe since uh, probably about 2000 uh, and moved to the UK in 2003. Uh, and uh, like Jeff, I work with our groups across Europe. Um, we have offices, uh, corporate-owned places, in the UK, Ireland, Germany, France, and Spain. And uh, fairly recently, we began franchising the enterprise brand across Western Europe, which is the first time that we franchised our brand, um, which is pretty exciting. So working on a lot of initiatives with that. Um, but uh, as Jeff mentioned, um, we're all very involved in diversity efforts from a um, director standpoint. Um, so I work on specifically with disability, with sexual orientation, and also with social mobility are the three areas that I focus on. So I've had the opportunity to work with Jeff and three other directors um, focusing on disability, um, looking at it from all sides, from a customer standpoint, from an employee standpoint. Um, and it's been a lot of fun to work on that and uh, done a lot of work through the Business Disability Forum um, and had some great support from the team there um, on getting us uh, going on our journey. So it's been great. Fantastic. And I, I'm a big, big fan and, uh, of, of the BDF as well. I think that it is the best vehicle we have within the UK to really bring large organizations together to talk about these topics in the open and to talk about them in a pragmatic way and, and that enables us to take stuff forwards. Um, how big is Enterprise? I know you're a, you're a big company and uh, you've been around for a while. Um, how many employees do you have? We have 93,000 across the world uh, and been in business since 1957. Um, we have branch operations all over the world as well. Um, I'm going to do one slight correction because in your introduction you mentioned budget um, and we're actually um, Enterprise owns Enterprise Alamo, Rent-A-Car and National Car Hire. So um, that's all right. We, you, Sorry. We'll, we'll correct you. That's perfectly fine. Um, so very, very large uh, car hire company. We are the largest car hire company in the world. Um, and today we had really great news, and we've had a big promotion at Enterprise. Um, Chrissy Taylor, who is the granddaughter of our founder, Jack Taylor, uh, who's been in the business now for 16 years, she was just promoted 
our chief operating officer. And so that's great news. And Chrissy started her career, as we all did, in the management training program. So since we have a philosophy of promoting strictly from within, um, Chrissy started just like her dad did and her granddad did, is um, right in, in, on the shop floor. Um, and she was promoted today. So it's really exciting to see our third generation um, of our, our family, the family business, um, continuing to move up within the company. So that's great news for us today. Oh, fantastic. I know Deborah's got a question, so I'll hand over to Deborah. Well, and that's really cool, Donna, what you were just saying. That wasn't my question, but I think it's very cool that <laughs> Enterprise focuses on, you know, internal candidates. You know, mm -hmm. we have management programs and build from builds, you know, from within. And you've been there 25 years. Jeffrey's been there 23 years. Those mm -hmm. are pretty impressive. We don't really see that. Incorporation. So, uh, congratulations. And I have been a customer for many years um, with a lot of them that you mentioned. Enterprise is usually the first one, but National and Alamo. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, as a customer, y'all have done a good job. But great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I per I've made the mistake of actually going with some of your competitors and. And it's been disappointed. <laughs> it's like well, okay, happy to welcome you back at any time. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with you now. I'm always with you guys now. I only made that mistake a couple of times. But um, th the question I have is what? And first of all, we're very excited at Access Chat to be speaking to you since you're a corporation. We've spoken to a lot of different leaders. We've talked to leaders that are people with disabilities. We have talked to nonprofits. BBC was on, but it's always exciting to us to be talking about corporations that are making a difference for this community. So the question, yeah, the question I have for both of you, Donna and Jeffrey, is uh, it's um, not unusual for disability, uh, excuse me, diversity inclusion to have the different tracks since diversity means, you know, it's a lot of different uh, things, LGBT, mm -hmm. you know, uh, women um, and disabilities. And we see often in the work that we're all doing that some large corporations forget that disability is part of that. So we applaud you for that, first of all. But I'm curious why both you and Jeffrey, if y'all could just speak a little bit of why did you, when you were as an executive deciding which one, which part of diversity was interesting to you, why did you select disabilities? I'll, uh, I'll kick I'll it off. <laughs> um, so for me, it was uh, partly because when I looked at all of the different tracks of diversity, disability really touches all the others. So uh, that, that was part of it, is that I think it's anybody, it doesn't matter your gender, your sexual orientation, your background, ethnicity, all of that stuff, everybody equally um, can be affected by a disability at any time. And, and I know as you age, that even gets you know more likely that, that all of us are, are going to have um, some form of disability or, or challenge that we have to overcome. So for me that was part of it. I, I think the other part of it for me was that um, with uh, the, the disability stream compared to the other streams of, of diversity, it's, uh, it's one that technology can make a big impact on. And, and the things that we do to help or to make it easier for people with disabilities generally make it easier for everybody. Um, so it, it just, it, the technology fit for me was, it was a really good fit. And I will echo Jeff. Uh, I completely agree on, on both of those points. Um, I think, you know, as he mentioned, as, as population ages, I think the statistic is, you know, 80 to 85 percent of everyone will become disabled, whether that's temporarily or permanently at some point in their lifetime. So, um, you know, whether it's a short-term illness or disease or long-term or, or something that is, um, becomes permanent. So I think, you know, continuing to focus on areas that help all employees. Um, but I think, too, the thing that I'm interested around, and Jeff touched on this, you know, making enterprise a better place to work. And if people can come in, and not only is this a great place to work, um, but we're accommodating, we're flexible, um, they've got the right tools and things to excel and do their job, um, that just makes the engagement that much better. And so I think, you know, from my point of view, that's why disability is so interesting. Um, I think to you know you look at kind of the different strands of diversity 
and I think you know so many companies have done such a great job with women. There's obviously loads to do, um, but you know people have done a lot with religion. I think a lot around ethnic minorities, um, but disability can be challenging because unless your disability is a visible disability, you know there's a lot of people both outside of work that are applying for jobs or inside of work that are fearful of disclosing their disability for fear that they may be discriminated against or may not be given the same opportunity as the person sitting next to them. Um, so I think, you know, really focusing on creating an environment where people feel, feel really comfortable coming out with their disability and saying, hey, here's, here's my situation, here's where, where I need help. Um, and really working with their manager to come up with a great solution so that they can get on and provide great quality work. So, you know, I think it's really interesting from that, that area as well. Deborah, you're on mute. I'm getting off mute right now. Thank you. Um, I, excellent, excellent answers. And, you know, as a, um, a global disability inclusion strategist myself, but also a mother of a an adult child with uh, Down syndrome. I, I think your answers are um, there. They were excellent answers because what we find, and I write about a lot, is uh, you know disability is just part of life. It's not a tragedy. It's just it's a part of life. And I like what you said, Jeff, in that. Tying it with, into your technology background, because I'm a technologist as well, and um, and then as Donna was saying, it's all about let's make our employees let's be as supportive as possible, help them be as productive as possible, and the reality is, you know, we all have abilities and disabilities. So I, I, I great answers, and I want to hear a little bit more when you're ready about the survey you're doing because we want to help you get this information. I selfishly would like to see this kind of data be brought to the United States because we need this consumer data because often when we're talking to, when the community of people with disabilities are talking to corporations, we're saying, you better not leave us out, you're leaving money on the table, blah, blah, but we can't really ground it. And I often talk to the community and say, you know, okay, great. Well, so you know, for example, now because of Access Chat, that Enterprise is committed to including everyone, including people with disabilities. So if you are like me and you have a family member with a disability or you're a person with a disability yourself, vote with your wallet. Don't do business with any other car company except, what was it, Donna? Alamo, National, <laughs> Enterprise. And I'm serious. And yes, we're giving you kudos, but you deserve the kudos. And so join the conversations so that we can support you, but the community needs to support this as well. So back to you, Neil. Okay. Or, or uh, Jeffrey, or D if y'all want to comment on that, please do. Well, actually, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take a quick minute to, to talk about the, the um, Click Away Pound survey. We, through the Business Disability Forum, we met a company called Freeney Williams. We've actually met a lot of great companies um, in this space, but uh, Freeney Williams we now use to help us with designing more accessible products internally and, and externally. So as we develop our solutions, um, they're a big help. They're, they're a great firm for doing that. They approached us and said they were interested in trying to find out exactly what you just said, Deborah. How much money do companies leave on the table or lose because they're not building accessibility into their technical design? I think there was a, a survey, the walkaway pound that was done that was quite successful in showing how many businesses lose um, traffic and customers because their physical sites aren't accessible. But to our knowledge, nobody's really looked at the online accessibility. And with so much of the spend now being online and through technology, um, they, they really wanted to sort of see if we could quantify that, which would really give businesses a, a good launch point to say, we, we need to be focused on this. There's an actual tangible return you're going to get if you make things more accessible. So uh, they, they approached us. We gladly uh, volunteered to, to sponsor them and help out with it. And uh, so they created a survey. We'd love for anybody who has any type of disability um, in any country, frankly, you can, you can take it even if you're not in the UK, um, but with any type of disability to go in and take the survey, and it'll help us compile the data, get a sense of how much uh, impact there is on people uh, or on businesses when they, don't, when they do or don't make their sites accessible. Um, and then we want to share that. We, we really, you know, we want, obviously, 
selfishly, we want to use it within our own company because it's, it's great information to have, but we really want to share it with the world because we want to see all companies start to make the right decisions. Jeffrey, I, I have a quick question. But it could also be for people like my family that our daughter has a disability, but we vacation with her, we travel with her. So you would encourage people without disabilities globally to also take this so that we can see the true numbers, correct? You got it. Yes, Sam. Thank you for the clarification, Deborah. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, just to make sure, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's something that I, I, I know that Enterprise has already taken into account um, because I went on your site and I was looking at some of the rental options and I, and I know that you can, um, you can rent uh, additional controls for cars, adaptive controls with your cars and I know that you can, um, as a disabled customer, rent a vehicle on behalf of another driver as well because you may not be able to drive yourself. So I know that, it, you know, that this stuff is obviously embedded in your thought process, so it's great to see that. Um, I know Antonio has been queuing up for a while now, so I'm going to let him loose on you. Okay, thank you, so thank you, thank you, Neil. Now, um, uh, at the beginning of uh, the conversation, you were uh, explaining that you, the the, the countries that you, where you are present and that you no, that you, you have a global presence, and uh, over the past uh, over the past year and a half, we have we had the chance of meeting and interviewing people from different parts of the world where they are able to tell us you know, their experience about what's uh, our accessibility in Spain, in Canada, in the United States, uh, in, in many different countries generally. So what I would like to know from you is from your experience from working in, in all these, on, all, in, in all the countries, how you are able to learn from the best practices that some countries that have been implemented and bringing that to the enterprise. Yeah, I, I'm happy to take that. Um, I think um, growing up in the U.S. and um, living in the U.S. for a number of years, um, they do have an advantage with the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities uh, legislation, the Act, um, which requires all businesses to be completely accessible. Uh, and so they definitely have an advantage because it's just a flat-out requirement. We certainly don't have that here in the UK, and there's certainly a lot of reasons for that. Um, the country is definitely considerably older. There's a lot of infrastructure challenges and so forth that um, I think most countries in the world would be more similar to the UK rather than to the US because I think the US has gone completely to the other extreme, which is great. Um, but I think, you know, for, from a business standpoint, um, because we don't own all of our locations, and in fact we own a very small percentage of them, um, we can't go out and retrofit and do all sorts of things. Um, we certainly work with all of our landlords to do um, things that we are able to fix and so forth with, to make our buildings uh, accessible. Um, but I think from our point of view, we've been able to focus on what we can do and for our branch locations and so forth that aren't accessible, um, we do provide as part of our great service, um, our great pickup service, we will go pick up a customer um, and bring them back to our location. We can deliver a car to someone who um, perhaps is not able to get into one of our locations because of an accessibility related issues so we can deliver a car to their home or to their office and um, subsequently collect the car um, when the customer's finished with it. So um, I think from our point of view it's really trying to think or get creative and think around things that you can do um, when it comes to customers. I think um, there's a lot of companies that have done some really neat things around disability. Barclays in particular has done a great job. I think Marks and Spencer has done a great job. So looking at um, and really sharing best practice with other companies um, who are in our in our place in a retail focus um, uh, operation where you've got customers coming in and out of your branches. Um, so really looking to mirror up with like-minded businesses and find out um, what people are doing. And I think, you know, a, a, in this space, as in any other really diversity related space, um, employers are really happy to share with one another and benchmark with one another and um, really work to get creative and share ideas and think about how, as a collective community, we can make um, this, you know, disability so much better for everyone. 
thank, uh, thank you so much, Sana. Uh, do you think that by by lead, leading by example, you are able to influence your suppliers? Definitely so. Um, as part of our supplier, when we go out to bid for suppliers, um, we do um, do a questionnaire with them, which we take into consideration what their diversity practices are in all areas, which includes disability, of course, um, but really want to learn from them around different things that we're doing um, or different things that they've learned from other customers that they've worked with. So definitely we can absolutely influence suppliers and really insist that certain things are done to a certain standard or to a different level, and I, and I think that's been really important. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I need to mention the actual uh, survey, which is the, the URL, which is www.clickawaypound.com, all one word. Uh, there's also um, a Twitter handle, which is at CAP survey, and there is a hashtag as well, which is hashtag CAP survey. Um, so we'll be uh, mentioning that again during access chat um, because we want everyone to participate as much as possible. Um, yeah, so Jeff, going back to the, the technology issue because I, I know uh, as a fellow technologist it's, a, it's something that interests me. Um, how have you found implementing assistive tech um, within, within your, your uh, work environment? Because um, that's one of the things that challenges everyone in, in, in the BDF. We, we, we talk about it quite openly in our meetings, how we're towards the left of the maturity <laughs> matrix rather than the right. Um, so, so what are the things that you found um, most challenging and, and also um, most rewarding once you've managed to, to implement? Well, I, I wish I could identify more rewards than challenges, but uh, unfortunately, I see more challenges. Sure. Because, um, as you said, we're, we're early on our journey. Um, it's actually something that, that I quite like about the Business Disability Forum is that we can talk with other, you know, other very large companies that are in the same boat, and it's a, it's a, a place where we're not going in trying to shame each other or, or compete. We're really trying to all help each other get better, and, and everybody has a, a true interest in it. So. When I look at ours, the, the challenges I see uh, with assistive tech, one of the big ones for us is just our internal processes. We are a huge company, and so sure. we're very careful, and we have a lot of, I guess, red tape around in, uh, introducing new technology into our environment, because you've got to be very careful with security and scalability and resilience, and, and so you can't just start you know, introducing random new pieces of tech without it having some, some impact. So I think excuse me, one of the, the biggest challenges that we have is just identifying what are the right assistive technologies to introduce, to make available, and then how do you make them available in a way where people who need them can easily get approval and get access and, and, and get the, the piece of technology they need. Um, and as I said, we're, we're fairly early on that journey. Donna and I are kicking off a project right now to revamp the way that people handle um, uh, personalizing their, their workplace. And, and it's, it's reasonable adjustment, but we, we've, in fact, Neil, it might have been you that coined this term for me, uh, workplace personalization. I, I love that phrase because when, when we put this in place, we want to make it easy for people to get whatever it is, whatever it uh, is, uh, personalization they need in their workplace to do their job better. That could be uh, some assistive technology like JAWS or, or any other type of, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of some good, uh, some text and font tools and, and there's just a variety of things that we could make available on a more standard, easy to get basis. But it could be things that somebody who wouldn't normally think of themselves as having any sort of disability, but there's just a way to make their work place better and therefore make their work life better and therefore they're going to be a more more productive at work and so um, we're, we're really keen on making that a seamless process. No, that, that's excellent um, and I stole the term from one of our former guests, uh, a, a chap called Alistair Somerville uh, from Acuity Design and we had a chat with him about extreme personalization because ultimately some of the stuff that we do in accessibility is, is the, at the extreme end but equally you're right, the vast majority of people that need 
things changing, they're only small personalizations, yet mm -hmm. it can prove to be quite difficult in an enterprise environment. I was actually speaking at the AGM of the British Assistive Technology uh, Association today, along with Paul Smythe from Barclays, and um, we were talking about some of the challenges in, in enterprise, but also setting out our stall and asking the guys that make the assistive technology to help us by um, making their licensing models easier, um, giving us things like installers that, that work in a corporate environment because, okay, so so things like Dragon, naturally speaking, and Text Help, they're, they're done and, and I don't know which, I'm getting technical, sorry people, um, I don't know which deployment mechanism you're using, whether it be SCCM or Active Directory or, or Radia or whatever, but you can you can deploy packages automatically down to the users, uh, and and that makes life a lot easier. Because if you've got lots of sites, which enterprise will have, then you, the last thing you want to do is send an engineer out with a box uh, to to the site to install the disk manually. Um, it costs you money, and then someone's going to put the box in the cupboard, and um, when that computer breaks and you rebuild it. The, you find out that the cleaner's tidied up and that box is no longer there. You've lost the license key and someone can't work. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so we, we're, we're pleading with, with some of the, the, the smaller manufacturers, you know, come along and, 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 and it would be great to, to get people at enterprise as well involved in the discussion process with, with vendors of AT to make them more enterprise friendly. And, um, and on the other side, where we're talking to enterprise software vendors like SAP through the Business Disability Forum, putting them in touch with people from assistive technology so that we can collectively make it easier to make this stuff work together because the interoperability is, is quite a challenge, as you'll know. A absolutely. Uh, you know, in, in an environment like ours, we've got so many different te endpoint technologies out there that, that we have to think about. It's not just plugging it into one particular scenario. You've got thin clients and tablets and PCs and laptops and, you know, all these growing uh, endpoint devices. So, so that's a big part of it. And, and you also touched on, I think, the other side of that equation. When you buy software as a service from, from any number of large vendors, which is a, is a growing, you know, uh, desirable thing to do, I think we have a responsibility, the large enterprises, to come together and, and make sure that the providers of that technology know how important these things are to us because each one of us individually isn't going to have, as, as big as our voices are individually, it's going to be much better if we collectively are saying the same things. I totally agree and, and, and that's what we're doing through the BDF and it's, it's starting to pay off and, and, and I, I know that we've, we're also collecting the, the sort of the signatures from the, the top level management of these large companies now. So not not just saying you've got their buy and we're actually getting them to write saying it's important to us. Um, and, and that's going to make people sit up and take note. Absolutely. So um, just going a bit to the to, to the left field again. Uh, I've seen quite a lot about autonomous vehicles lately. You know, self-driving driving cars and, and Google and so on. So how long do you think it will be before Enterprise introduces its first autonomous car? Well, I'll tell you what. We, that is obviously something very that we keep a very close eye on because it will have a large impact on our business model. Sure. Um, we think in some really cool, cool ways, so we're very excited about it. Um, but but I, I want to preface what I'm about to say that this is Jeff King's opinion, not Enterprise's opinion. Sure, of so, course. So me as a technologist, uh, it, it's interesting. If you would have asked me this question maybe as little as a couple years ago, I would have said we're well more than 10 years away from seeing any kind of real real volume in autonomous driving vehicles on the roads. Um, you'll, you'll see the, the test vehicles out there with Google and, and others, but but I really thought we had quite a ways to go. In the last two years, um, I've gone to a lot of technology conferences where this comes up as a topic, and I, I heard somebody last year make a really interesting point, and that was that all of the components um, seem to be coming together at just the right time to expedite that 
in, in a way that I think is going to surprise people. And, and, I, and I think, to, again, two years ago I felt differently, but now with artificial intelligence, with robotics, with the Internet of Things, with all the, the, the connectivity, um, that is all kind of, each piece is, is escalating much faster and, and they're starting to come together, which caused them each to, to build off each other and feed off each other. And so the, the gentleman uh, that was speaking, I can't even remember his name, made the point that these kinds of things take a long time to gain the initial traction, but as they start building on each other, it goes surprisingly quickly to get certain things across the finish line. And I, I think autonomous vehicles is going to be the, the, an example of that. So, so I don't know what year it's going to hit, where you, they're common, and I don't know what year Enterprise is going to have them, but I will say that I am now on the underside of 10 years for sure. Um, I think we're 5 to 10, not not 10 to 15. Okay. And I, I think it's a very exciting technology for a lot of people with disabilities, particularly those with visual impairments, um, but also for the older population. So um, my father being a good example of that, um, you know, he has to reapply for his driving license every year. But if you um, if you think about it, you know, older people they want their independence, and driving enables that. Um, you take away a driving license, you're most likely to remove the social interaction that they're experiencing, and 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 quite likely shorten their lifespan because they're not they're not going out and doing the things that they were doing before and having the kind of quality of life before. So actually, it's a it's a really serious it has really serious implications for in a positive way for people with disabilities. Uh, Neil, and, uh, and, and please don't forget that we're able to see some stats where the number of young people who are uh, applying for driver, li driver license is uh, reducing. So there's a lot of, um, there's less people today taking that step. It, it was, it used to be a sort of a step into, you know, into how you were growing and you're becoming an adult. adult. So that step is basically you see the percentage going down in terms of number of uh, teenagers taking, that are going to apply for driver's license. Sure. That's yeah, really interesting, I think, because I know when I worked in California and growing up in California, everybody had a driving license. And when you were 16, you went to the Department of Motor Vehicles on your birthday to get your driving license because it was so important. And everyone I knew drived. It's just what you did. Uh, and then I moved to New York and uh, in Manhattan where cars are expensive, parking is expensive and so forth. There's, you know, and, tr and transportation, public transportation is so great. So few people actually drove. Um, and of course, similar here in the UK, specifically in London, but in other larger metropolitan, you know, city, city centers and so forth where you don't need a driving license. So it is absolutely true that the percentage of people driving um, is decreasing. Yeah. I think uh, the, the models of how people are getting transportation are, are changing. You, mm -hmm. you look at, we do car rental, which we've done, you know, for a long time now, um, in short term and long term, but now we're doing a lot more car share where you know, the enterprise car share brand is all about people who just need a vehicle for an hour here or an hour there. So whether it's inner city or whatever, I think that's a growing trend that, that people who are younger don't feel the need to own that asset. They just want to consume it as a service whenever they require it. Um, so so that, you know, that is going to be an interesting thing. We, we quite like that trend growing. Um, and then you add autonomous vehicles into that, and now anybody can, you know, at some point look on their phone, say they need a car, it shows up at their front door, they get into it, it take, you know, they tell it where it wants to go, and they, they take them there, take them back, and so they're really, all the barriers that, that anybody with a disability, for example, today has, almost completely fall away when, when you've got that environment. Yeah, uh, assuming a, a number of things. So um, I'm, I'm thinking um, that you know, you need to do the app development accessibly, um, that, that you need to find the right kind of vehicles that enable people to get in and out easily and all of this kind of stuff. And yet, enterprise has a great, is in a great position to influence that market because you have enormous purchasing power. You're buying you know, fleet purchasing in, in, a, in, a, in, in a massive way. So um, companies are going to listen to you. If you say this is a requirement, you know, we, we need this, um, 
they're going to they're going to pay attention. It's a bit. I, I know that even Ferrari are now designing their vehicles to be easier to get in and out of, because the the people are, that are buying them are now in their fifties. They're not they're not young people. <laughs> so actually, even Ferrari have to take into account accessibility. So uh, I want to make a, a comment. So you know, having that experience de dealing with, with with people with disabilities, do you see it uh, as you know we all today we have uh, people you know, selling software as a service. You know, uh, renting cars as a service for people with disabilities is this the right way of putting the the, the question? I, I feel like that's a real business model out there that that you don't have to, especially if you don't need it you know, all day, every day, which most people really don't need their cars all day, every day. So um, when you can consume the, the need for a vehicle just at the point in time when you need it, and, and, and again, if it's, if it's got autonomous driving and a very easy, accessible way to book it and to interact with it, I think that just makes it, you know, even more likely that people are going to grab it. I know that I would certainly gravitate that direction over driving myself around and owning my own vehicle and having to worry about it and park it and maintain it. Okay. I've, 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 I've got one got last one question, question. Uh, and, and it's a less geeky one, and it's for Donna. <laughs> um, and, and that is, um, how, how are enterprise uh, encouraging people with disabilities to enter the business? I know you're, you're talking, we've talked about how you're aiming to retain them, but what, what are you doing to um, attract disabled talent to enterprise? Well, most people do join us in our management training program. That's our biggest entry point into the business. Most people start there and then move into other areas of the business. So one thing from a disability standpoint, um, we have disabled employees who drive and disabled employees that as a result of their disability, they don't drive. Um, and having a driving license for the management training program is a requirement for the role. Um, and when we started looking at this a few years ago, we started breaking it down and, and really looking at the driving aspect of the role because part of the role involves going out and calling on customers, whether that's insurance companies, body shops, dealerships, and so forth, calling on them, doing service calls as well as, well as sales calls. And to do that, you drive to those appointments. And we started breaking it down and thinking, okay, is being able to go out on a sales call, is that the essential job function? Or is being able to drive to the sales call the essential job function? And ultimately, it's of course the former. It's being able to be on the sales call. You don't actually have to drive yourself there. Um, so through, pro through programs like Asset Access to Work and a number of other things, um, we've been able to um, hire a number of disabled employees who don't drive into our management training program. Um, and that's been terrific because those employees are available, they're in the branch, they are um, able to help out with customer service um, in the branch, and then when they need to typically go out one day a week on their sales calls, they're able to do that um, through other programs. So I think really looking at it, and I would encourage other companies to look at if they have specific job requirements for jobs, really kind of break that down and think how essential is that piece of the job um, and look at different ways um, and really focus on on what people can do and what and not what they can't do and really focus on their strengths um, and so for the management training program um, we've overcome it that way um, and then with other positions those are typically more office based or even home based um, so those are actually quite simple because often it's just a technology technology solution or an equipment solution that we're able to accommodate fairly easily so um, I think just really looking at things from a different point of view and, and being a little bit creative um, we've been able to attract um, a good percentage of disabled people into the company which is great for our business because our customers are certainly disabled and we want our employees to mirror the customers that we serve and that means employees from um, all ages, gender, all walks of life, backgrounds, religion and so forth and disability of course is a big piece of that. Okay, Deborah, you want to wrap up? Yeah, and just, you know, Donna, I did not realize that Enterprise was such a diverse, um, that, that you really um, 
valued the diversity in your employees. I just did not realize that as one of your customers. And so you can bet that I will now be talking about it all over the place. So I'm really glad to know about it. And I was tweeting <laughs> like a dork uh, while you were doing this. So it's like I'm already saying, come on, everybody. We all, as this community, need to take this survey. And thank you so much to Enterprise for all you're doing for your employees with disabilities, for your customers with disabilities, and for all of us. We need this kind of data. So thank you, thank you for the efforts. And Neil, I will hand it back to you to okay. roll it up. But we sure are grateful for both of your efforts, Jeffrey and Donna, and all of Enterprise. Oh, our pleasure. Thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward Thank to joining you. you on Twitter. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.